great is your love let the whole earth sing let the whole earth sing you reach for us from on heaven's throne when we had no hope you are the way there is no other you are the way there is no other you rose from death to victory you reign in life oh majesty your name be high and lifted up jesus shine the sun you are glorious you are glorious Lord over all you have made us new we owe it all to you in everything be exalted in Exalted, you rose from death to victory. You reign in life, O oh Majesty. Your name be high and lifted up, Jesus. Jesus alive. Welcome to Online Church. Uh, welcome both to new and regulars, uh, believers and inquirers. Uh, welcome especially uh, to all the mothers. 
Uh, Mother's Day in isolation is more complicated than usual. Uh, For many of us, uh, we're really thankful uh, to God for our loving mums, um, even as we can't be with them. Uh, For others, uh, today is painful, uh, remembering uh, a mother gone, a child never had, or or mothers who were never what we hoped. Uh, However it is that you come today, joyous or uh, with a tinge of grief, uh, the living God warmly welcomes us. He faithfully loves all his people uh, and his saving love fills us with joy. Uh, Psalm 98 puts it, Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. So we have seen the salvation of God in the gift of his son. And so knowing his faithful, saving love, I'd invite you to join with me as we sing together, Holy is the Lord. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. The earth is filled with his glory and our hearts are filled with gratitude. And so together we give thanks. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless you for our creation, preservation and all the blessings of this life. 
but above all for your amazing love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us that due sense of all your mercies, that our hearts may be truly thankful, and that we may declare your praise not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory now and forever. Amen. If you're one of our younger members, it'd be great if you come closer. I've got something special for you. It's about God's love. Uh, we talk about God's love a lot because there is nothing like God's love. God's love's great. Uh, no one loves like God. See, we all love others. We all love others, but, well, God's love is so much bigger. God's love is bigger. Can you see that? See, our hearts, we love our friends, and our hearts, we love good people. I want to tell you about Simon. Simon has a heart that's a lot like ours. Simon loves good people. Simon loves his friends. So I want to tell you he's got a friend called Sarah. Here's Sarah. Sarah's great. She's a super terrific friend. Um, when Simon comes to school and he forgets his pencils, Sarah's always there and she will share her pencils with him. And when, when Sarah has a little bit extra money, she goes to the canteen, she buys a big and she shares with Simon. I hope your canteen has things like that. Uh, and sometimes when Simon's not around and other people are saying mean things about him, Sarah always says nice things. She defends him. She's a great friend and that's why Simon's heart goes out to Sarah. He loves her. She's a super friend. But there's a very different boy at school I want to tell you about. His name's Stu. Here's Stu. Whew. Stu's a bit mean. Stu's really Simon's enemy. So Stu one time stole all of Simon's pencils. And there's another time where Simon had brought extra money and he brought food to share, but Stu took them all. Absolutely every last one scoffed them. And there are times when Simon isn't around and Stu says really mean, really nasty, cruel, horrid lies about him. And that's why Simon's heart doesn't really go to Stu. Now one Monday, one particular Monday, Sarah got in trouble with the teacher. And it was the kind of trouble that, well, only Simon could help her out of. But if he did, it would mean that Simon would be in trouble. Now Simon's heart loved his friend. And so he helped her, even though many got in trouble. The next day, wouldn't you believe it, Tuesday, Stu got in trouble. More trouble that only Simon could help and rescue him out of again. Um, and again, if Simon did it, he'd be in trouble. But Simon's heart had no love for Stu, so he did nothing. Remember what I said at the start? God's heart is bigger than ours. It's bigger than ours. Uh, God doesn't just save his friends. He saves his enemies. He loves both the Stews and the Sarahs. He loves both of them. He loves all of them. He loves us so much that he died to save us. Listen to these great words from the Bible. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, a good man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. He might die for a friend. But God demonstrates, he shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, his enemies, Christ died for us. That's what makes God's love so much bigger than our love. We might die for a friend, God dies for his enemies. God's love is bigger. He saves his enemies. Why don't we give thanks for his big love? Heavenly Father, thanks so much for your love, that you love your friends, you love your enemies so much that you gave your son that we could become your friends forever. Help us to remember that love now and always. Amen. Uh, we break today from our series in 2 Corinthians to hear from our new bishop, uh, Gary Koo. Uh, Gary's going to bring us a word of hope from Romans 5, but Given our lockdown, uh, it may be some time before we meet him in person, and so this is our chance to uh, have him come amongst us and encourage us. 
But one of our great blessings in this time of lockdown has been hearing from other parts of our church family, other members. Uh, Ian and Erica, uh, members of our 10 a.m. congregation, have been for some time. I won't put dates on it. Uh, before they lead us in a time of prayer, they've been very gracious and willing, uh, allowing us to hear a little of how God has worked in their life. Uh, if we could start, well, not at the very beginning, but at least early on, how did you both come to follow the Lord Jesus? Well, uh, I guess with me, it started with a, with a particular step in the Billy Graham hmm. crusade in 1959, uh, where I was quite young. And um, I, uh, I, came, I went forward at the crusade and uh, beavered away at uh, notes and so on for study of the Bible. Mm. And throughout my teen years, and I suppose my early 20s, I had a lot of ups and downs, going backwards and going forwards. And uh, I guess... Um, one of the things I prayed for as I was getting older was I, I needed God to send me a bombshell. So dangerous prayer. Da it was a dangerous prayer because I um, got together with Erica <laughs> and we got married when I was, I think, about 25. And we, um, we set about a life together and we... Uh, always prayed together mm. as a couple and we uh, we went to a new church because we bought a house in a different area and uh, we went to St Paul's Carlingford mm. which at the time was a I, I suppose you'd say it was a big church in a little building mm. it was a tiny little stone church the side, I can't remember the road, Carlingford. And um, Harry Goodyear was our first mm. minister there and he made sure that we, uh, as we walked out of church for the first time, he got hold of us and got hold of the people behind us and <laughs> made sure that we were connected. Welcomed you someone. in. Yeah. yeah, beautiful. Yeah, so uh, that was um, quite a time. Really. Yeah. For us both, yeah, and um, I guess the the next step was we had uh, a son in 1972, and that was uh, a great thing for us. Mm. Um, but that we had the trouble was that we our son got uh, a disease that was really we were told that he would probably die within a year yep and um that was a very testing time yes and i prayed that he would be healed mm. but he wasn't healed yeah and i guess that threw me into a turmoil yep uh i was angry at god for not healing him and I was in a lot of turmoil. Yes. Um, looking back on it, I think now that knowing more about healing, I guess, which we've mm. looked at in, the, in uh, our studies and so on. Yeah. I think the healing was meant for me. Yeah. And not for my son. Yes. So and that, that was quite a revelation. Yeah. Um, I know that Jesus didn't heal everyone he came across. Yeah. Only certain ones. And it was to make a point. Yes. Um, about healing. Well, about who was God and who wasn't. Yep. And uh, so that was, that was, uh, that, you know, at the time, that was about 1982, that was... Mm. So we set about throwing ourselves into restoring our house and in, in, um, where we were in Sydney and we sold that and moved up to Clarence mm. and came here to St Paul's with me. Yeah. 
It makes it much easier when we have the same names of the churches, doesn't it? Um, so, then um, we had various, uh, I, I suppose I always have ups and downs. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that came home to me really was that uh, some time ago I had to make a stand for Jesus at a time when our community uh, said that our church should be standing for something else. Yeah. And that was sort of a, another moment yes. in my life. But I'm still learning. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Like you've hinted there, there's been bombshells, there's been the, the suffering uh, and yeah. the megaphone of pain, but there's also been some joyous moments yeah. you know, marrying a bombshell. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, and the blessing of being welcomed in, standing for Jesus. Uh, Erica, your own journey of coming to Christ and, and the way in which hardship has shaped that. Yes, um, I grew up always being um, shepherded and loved by um, churches, Yeah, various ones as I grew up, but I always felt nurtured and mm. um, I had a strong faith in Christ all of my life yeah I've been very blessed and uh, as Ian said um, there were moments when we connected with one another as bombshells do <laughs> and certainly um, the life and death of Jamie had a very big impact on both of us and me yep um, but I didn't um, blame God or get angry with God I I threw myself on his mercy, I suppose. Yes. And uh, that's how I dealt with that. And in in the challenges that um, in the rest of my life, that's been my place of safety Yeah. in God. The mercy of God, throwing mm. yourself in there. Mm. That's really helpful. You've hinted at certainly a really major um, area of suffering and loss. Um, there are others that could be listed for you guys, um, some really difficult times, you know, time, hard times in your own family, your own marriage, hard times in church life. Um, it hasn't always been easy either. What have you learned about God through hardship? I've learned that God is faithful. Yeah. Um, I've learned mm. that plodding along, um, praying and reading the Bible and reflecting um, we both grown very much through doing that. Yeah. And that God sends people into your lives when you need them. So friends who have loved us and been faithful to us and haven't tried to instruct us but been with us when things were hard. Mm. And, um, and then there have been little moments of what I call angels coming. So little times where God has sent people into our lives and given us a special blessing yes. to help us on our way. Um, Ian suffers from depression and so there have been times when he's felt very dark. Yeah. But we're very glad for good medical treatment and yep. um, and activities and projects to, to keep him busy and happy in life. Yeah. Um, with particularly with our relationship with God, we'd, we've discussed this together, that there's no doubt that God's great faithfulness to us has been the, the marker that's yes. been part of our lives. And we know um, he's always there for us when we need him. He listens yeah. to us. He responds to us. And as a couple, we've learnt over our 50 years of marriage to depend on him for that. Yeah. Tempted to break into a chorus of great is thy faithfulness. Well, I've got it written I'm, down. Uh, you know, I, well, if I'm, you'd asked me before, I would have said, how does Ian cope? He copes with chocolate. How do I cope? I cope with singing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, chocolate and singing, a great combination. Good Probably combo. not at the same time. No. If no. I could finally ask you, though, you, like you've learned about God, what have you learned about loving others through hardship? I think that there are times when it's very hard. You, you just haven't got enough left in yourself to give out to others. So yeah. I think yeah. Ian would say that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think uh, you can be just drained. Yes. At times like that. 
and uh, but at other times we are able to help others. Yes. And uh, connect with people. Yeah. Um, we like to hear other people's stories and share yeah. our stories with them, and um, that's been. I, I was thinking of that song, "Brother, Let Me Be Your Servant." Mm. Um, let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. Yeah. It's a two-sided thing, loving yes. other people. Mm, we give to them, they give back to us. Absolutely. They are great things to learn. Um, you spoke of the faithfulness of God. Uh, you're going to lead us in prayer to him now, so I'll ask you to do that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming before you in prayer. We thank you that you are a God who cares for his people and his creation. We thank you for your goodness, mercy and compassion. We thank you that your steadfast love endures forever and your faithfulness to all generations. Lord, we pray for our broken and divided world, for countries who are broken by war and for those where COVID disease is destroying vast numbers of lives. We pray for the leaders of the countries to exercise wisdom and justice. We pray for our leaders in Australia, for our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, the Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, and Lithgow Mayor, Ray Thompson. We thank you for the peace and stability we have been able to experience, even in these difficult times. Lord, we know that you are the ruler of the nations, and we pray that leaders would respect your authority, justice and mercy. We pray that we might respect the power and authority that our leaders have so that we will be kept safe and be mindful of the safety of others. We pray for the leaders of our church churches at this time. We pray for our Archbishop Glenn Davies, our Bishop Gary Koo and our pastors Mark Smith and John Young. Strengthen them to be faithful witnesses to Jesus in all their life and words. We thank you for the word of God that is available to us in all, available to us in this land so freely. We pray that we would be united in the truth of your gospel and be willing to humbly accept the authority of the scriptures. We thank you that despite restrictions, we are able to gather digitally to listen to your word and hear it explained to us so clearly. We thank you for our church and pray that we might love truth, speak the truth in love and defend truth for the coming generation of believers. Bless the programs for our young people and children that John Young and his team are creating online. Thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in every believer in establishing and strengthening our faith. Continuing in prayer. May our church be a place of blessing to all. May we demonstrate Jesus' compassion to others in our community. May we care for their physical, emotional and spiritual needs. We thank you for the gift of friendship. Lord, we saw how you were a friend to many as you walked upon this earth. We pray that we will take time to love others generously, to phone or visit or bring a gift of food. We know that at this time, many are suffering great hardship and pain. We pray for those who feel isolated and alone. We pray for those who feel under pressure in their jobs. We thank you that you hear the prayer of those who cry out to you. 
and we pray that you will comfort and relieve them. We pray for the staff, residents and families of New March House. Give wisdom to those who are making decisions to help in these difficult situations and compassion to those who care for them. Lord and Father, we think of those who are linked to our church to better serve the spread of the gospel. We pray for Mark Muss as a prison chaplain at Lithgow, for ministry to university students by Sarah Varga and Caitlin Ogg, for the Hadfield family and their work with Missionary Aviation Fellowship, and the Blair family working with refugees in Sydney. We pray for Tracy Staines and the work of Arise in the Philippines, and for Howard and Michelle and their children as they are on furlough from their work in the Philippines. The spread of COVID-19 has changed the work of these ministries and presented new challenges and different opportunities. We pray that we will continue as a church and individuals to give them prayerful and financial support. O gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate upon you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled soul. You are the peace in my troubled sea In the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea oh, You are the peace in my troubled
He is our peace in troubled seas. Uh, Join with me in words of praise to him uh, drawn from the book of Peter. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In God's great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In God's great mercy, he has given us an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for us. In God's great mercy, he powerfully shields us through faith until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, we greatly rejoice, though now for a little while we may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These trials come so that our faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Good morning. My name's Nick McKinney. I attend the eight o'clock services here at St Paul's. The, New, the Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 to 31. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens, who created all these. He who brings out the starry host one by one, and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The New Testament reading is from Romans uh, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more? having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Well, hello, everybody. Gary Koo here. It's nice to be with you uh, here today. And uh, let me start by asking you a question. What do you hope for? What, what do you hope for? What 
are you looking forward to? What do you dream about? What do you want? Uh, it's a question that the answer changes over time, doesn't it, depending on where you are. I mean, for example, when I was a boy, I wanted, I hoped for, a grey Nichols cricket bat, one with a big scoop on the back, possibly two if I was lucky. And then as time progressed, uh, what I hoped for was a job, a job I'd enjoy and would pay well as well. Then a bit further down the line, I hoped to find that special person I could spend the rest of my life with. What have you hoped for? And how's it turned out? Because the things that we hope for don't always turn out, do they? I mean, I did find that special person I had to spend the rest of my life with, but I'd never got that cricket bat and my job didn't turn out the way I expected. Uh, and that's because the things that we hope for don't always happen. And as a result, many of us are cautious. We don't want to put all our eggs into the one basket. We don't want to go all in lest we be disappointed and end up being hurt. And the question I want to ask you as we look at the Bible today is should we bring the same attitude when it comes to God? Uh, should we bring the same attitude when it comes to the hope that we have and what God has promised? Uh, should we be cautious of going all in lest we end up being disappointed? That's what we're going to be looking at from the Bible today. And it'd be really good if you could have Romans chapter 5 open before you. And here in Romans chapter 5, the author, Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, starts in verse 1 by telling them how much they have in Jesus. So if you'd like to come with me to verse 1 and have a look there, you'll see that Paul starts by saying, we have been justified. And what does that mean? Uh, to be justified means uh, being able to stand before God just as if I'd done nothing wrong. To be justified means uh, having a clean slate, being declared not guilty before a judge. That's what a Christian has by trusting in Jesus. And that's not all. Uh, the second thing Paul says is that a Christian also has peace with God. Rather than being God's enemy, they are now friends and family. And in, while it might not look like Paul is saying much at this point, if you have the eyes to see it, it's a bit like going to a buffet. You know what it's like to go to a buffet. I love going to buffets. I think buffets are wonderful. You, you walk into a buffet and, and it's all there before you. Uh, there's the prawns and the oysters. There's the roast and the, uh, uh, the salad, the pasta, the cheeses. There's so much dessert. Uh, going to a buffet is all about abundance. And that's what we have here in the first verse of our passage. This is a picture of abundance. What more could you want than to know that uh, when it comes to judgment, we are right with God. When it comes to our relationship, we are at peace with God. We're on the same side. This is a picture of abundance. This is really terrific. And please notice, these aren't things that we're actually looking forward to. These are things that we have now. We have been justified. We have peace with God because of Jesus. This is what we have now. And how is all this come about, please come and have a look with me at what it says in verse 2. And this is really special and really beautiful. Verse 2 tells us, we have gained access to all this by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And what does this mean? Well, let me try to explain this by asking you a question. How does a person become a Christian? How does a person establish a relationship with God. I mean, I didn't grow up as a Christian. I became a Christian later on in life at the age of uh, 21. And I used to think that becoming a Christian was all about the things that you do. That being a Christian was about being good enough or religious enough or following certain rules. And if you were good enough for God, then somehow you got in. But then I became a Christian and realised that actually I was wrong, that Becoming a Christian wasn't about the things that you do. 
But becoming a Christian, Christian was all about what God had done for us. And that's the word we find there, if you have a look at verse 2, again, that word grace. This word which is so very special and so very wonderful. Because what does it mean? The word grace means unmerited favour. It means receiving a gift, getting something for nothing. Uh, very early on, somebody taught me that grace, uh, to understand grace, it was G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. And this is how a person becomes a Christian. It's not through the things that they do, but what God has done for them. It's not about earning their way into heaven, but it's about receiving a gift. The gift that comes to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, who pays the price for our sins on the cross and rises from the dead. And this is why grace is one of my favourite words in the world. There's this word grace which turned my life upside down because so much of my life and so much of my experience was all about achievement and merit. And can you just imagine for a moment relating to God on that basis, according to the things that we do? It'd be like sitting in an exam every day of our lives, never knowing if we're good enough or we've done enough, if we were in or out. I mean, life would be filled with anxiety. You'd have absolutely no certainty at all. But grace is totally different. It gives us certainty. Because what grace tells us is that no matter what we do, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done in the past, despite the circumstances we face, in the good times and the bad, if we turn back to God, he'll be there waiting for us with open arms, ready to accept us because of the grace we have in Jesus. And can I just say to those of you watching, uh, for those of you who aren't yet Christian, can I just say this is why being a Christian is the best thing in the world. To know that God views us Warts and all, through the lens of grace, is a wonderful comfort and an incredible joy. Look, I don't know where you're at with God in your journey towards God, but if you're interested, why don't you drop this church a line? I'm sure the people here would love to talk to you about this amazing grace we can have in Jesus. The first thing Paul says is that we have so much in Jesus. But then rather surprisingly, at the end of verse 2, he goes on to say that there's actually more. Have a look at the end of verse 2 with me. He says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. And what does this mean? What is Paul talking about? He said, we have so much in Jesus but this isn't it. There's more to come. There's something to hope for because life isn't the way that God actually wants it to be. And, and when we step back to think about it, that's true, isn't it? Uh, despite his grace, we still sin against God. Despite all Jesus has done, people still reject him. And this world that we live in is far from perfect, we're still a long way away from what God has promised us in the Bible. And what has he promised us? He's promised us all sorts of things. Uh, but one of the things that he's promised us in Revelation chapter 21 is a future without sin or suffering, all its consequences, uh, where God will wipe every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. That's one of the things we hope for as God's people through Jesus. And another thing God speaks about in the Bible is a future where Jesus will be honoured. A future where the whole world will give Jesus the honour he deserves. Where every knee will bow and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father, as we're told in Philippians chapter 2. These are some of the things that Christians hope for. Christians look forward to that lie in our future. Where the end to suffering, 
the end to sin when God's glory and goodness will be witnessed and acknowledged by everyone. But we're not there yet. That's what we're told if you have a look at verse 3. And this side of hope, we still have tears. And the very existence of those tears can lead to doubt. It can dent our confidence in the promises of God. It can lead us to question whether our hopes will be fulfilled. And I'm sure there are plenty of us thinking exactly the same thing now. Because 2020 has been an extraordinary year. I mean, just think about it. It wasn't that long ago we were worried about drought and bushfires. And here we are in the midst of COVID-19. What's going on? Does God even care? Paul moves on to say two things to encourage us to keep on clinging to our hope. And the first thing he says, if you come back with me to verse 3, is that our suffering isn't meaningless. And it doesn't mean that it will crush our hopes. But actually our suffering can be used to help us hold on to our hopes. Our suffering can be used to help us in two different ways. Firstly, by producing perseverance. I mean, when you're suffering, what do you want more than anything else? You want your suffering to end. You want it to be all over. And as a result, our suffering can actually lift us out of our present to look forward to our future, to something that lies beyond this current situation, to something that is better. It can lead us to press on and persevere, looking for the hope that we have. Secondly, our suffering can also develop our character. And the word character, he has the sense of being tried and tested. It's a bit like what a manufacturer does with a car. I mean, they, they test their cars in difficult circumstances. They, they bring their cars to extreme heat. They bring it to Death Valley. They bring their cars to Scandinavia to test in the snow. Not to crush their cars or destroy their cars, but to make them better, to make them better stronger and there are times in our lives when our suffering can do that as well where our suffering can make us stronger and make us better where our suffering can help us keep growing to build our resilience so we'll keep pressing on all the way to the end now I want you to hear me clearly at this point I'm not saying that we as Christians should go out of our way to look for suffering and can I just say something? When we see someone suffering, it's really, really unhelpful to say, this is probably good for you. Let's not do that. But let me ask you a question which is related to hope. Do you think about the hope we have in Jesus when things are going well? Do you want Jesus to return when life is good? If I'm honest with myself, I rarely do. But when things are hard, when there's, pa when there's pain and suffering, hope, for me, ends up being front and centre. And I think at times our suffering can be a little bit like the focus button on our camera. We suffer and our hope, which is blurry, suddenly becomes clear. As we remember, as we remember why we hoped for this in the first place. And that what we're experiencing right now isn't the be all and end all. Suffering can help us. Remember, there's so much more to come. That there's something better to look forward to that God has promised his people. The first encouragement uh, Paul gives us is that our suffering isn't meaningless. And now the second encouragement is found in verses five to 11. And what Paul says here is that the hope that we have does not put us to shame. And that if we go all in with God, we won't be disappointed. Why? Because the God who makes this, these promises, who offers us this hope, loves us more than we can possibly imagine. Come and have a look with me at verse 6 in your Bibles. And Paul here says, you see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for 
the ungodly. Paul says that Jesus died on the cross for people like you and for me, paying the price that we were powerless to pay, paying the price for our sins, taking on judgment on himself in our place on the cross so we can be justified and have peace with God. That's what Jesus has done for us. And then in verse 7, Paul goes on to say this. Have a look with me. He says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. And in a way, what Paul is doing here in verse 7 is raising the question, who would you die for? Who would you save with your life? And when I ask myself that question, I'd say I'd die for my children, my wife, my sister. But I don't know about you, it's not a very long list. There are very few people I'd be willing to die for. And when it comes to the righteous person, the person who is upright, the good person, who helps lots of people, even for them, I'd have to think twice. There are very few people I'd give up my life for, but then there's God. Have a look at verse 8. What do we see here? What does Paul say? He says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what Paul says here in the Bible is really quite extraordinary. Christ dies for the ungodly, for sinners like us, but when does he do this? While we were still sinners. And if you have a look at verse 10, we as sinners are considered God's enemies as those who are opposed to him, those in rebellion, shaking our fist at him, denying his right to rule, uh, denying his existence. That's when Christ was willing to die for us. And it wasn't like, you know, we'd turned back to him or asked him to do it or done something to deserve it. No, God has loved us in Jesus at our worst. And this shows us how much God loves us. That he'd send Jesus to die for people like us at that time. I mean, just take a moment. Take a moment to think about dying for an enemy. I mean, would you do that? Or dying for someone who wronged you or dying for someone who hated you. The online bully, the gossip, the liar, the impossible neighbour, the shonky tradesman, would you die for them? I mean, we wouldn't do it for them, but God does it for us. That just shows us how much God loves us. And if nothing else, this should give us confidence, great confidence that God can be trusted and wants what's best for us. And that the things that he's promised, he's going to deliver on. I mean, if he loved us as enemies, how much more will he love us as his family? And, you know, when I I think about God's love, it's a bit like a child learning to swim for the first time, isn't it? You know what it's like. The child there standing at the edge of the pool, filled with trepidation, about to step into the water, nervous, anxious, not knowing what to do, but willing to step into the water because their parents are waiting for them. Knowing that their parents care, knowing that they're safe with their parents, knowing all this because they know their parents love them. And it's very much the same when it comes to us and God, is knowing that he loves us that allows us to step into the water to keep on trusting him despite our fears. And if there's nothing else you take away from what we've looked at from the Bible today, please know this, that it's knowing the depth of God's love that forms the foundation for our hope. It's knowing the depth of God's love that forms the foundation of our hope. And isn't it good to know that in a time of tremendous uncertainty. Here is something we can be certain of that we can anchor our lives to.
we can be certain that God really loves us because Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your tremendous love for us. We know that we're undeserving. We know that uh, we've sinned against you, yet in your grace, in your mercy, in your love and generosity, you sent your son Jesus to us so he could be justified and at peace with you. And we thank you for your tremendous promises of a future without sin or death or mourning or crying or pain, when Jesus will be, where Jesus will be honoured by all the entire world. We pray, Father, that you would help us to cling on to this hope that you, we would persevere and you would build our character so that we might enjoy all that you've promised your people and won through the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, he'll come through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. God is our strong deliverer, our strength, our shield. Uh, stay online and keep chatting, encouraging one another in that public chat spot. But after that, uh, pick up the phone. Call someone God has laid on your heart this morning, today. Uh, but three things to bring to your attention. Uh, first, Fresh Food Day. Uh, if you'd like to assist with next Sunday's Fresh Food Day, either receiving and packing on the Friday or distributing on Sunday at either Lithgow or Portland, please contact me. Uh, the second thing, communion. Uh, next Sunday, we return to the sufficient grace of 2 Corinthians. We'll also share again in communion, uh, an expression of our common faith in Christ, our unity even as we're apart. Um, because of our lockdown restrictions, uh, please prepare in advance by having uh, your own bread and, and wine or juice ready uh, that you might share and participate. Third thing to bring to your attention is discovering Christianity. It may be that you haven't yet put your trust in Christ. If you're still exploring him and you'd like the privacy of doing that online, uh, after watching this clip, I'll share with you a great website where you can find out more at your own pace. What do you make of Jesus? He spoke as the King of Heaven, but served like the lowest slave. He claimed to be the hope of the world, yet gave up his life on the cross. 
Have you ever wondered how Jesus saw the big issues? God, the world, and you? Here's life according to Jesus in 3, 2, 1. 3. God is a loving union of three. I don't know how you picture God, but according to the Bible, Jesus is our picture of God. He's called the image of God, the word of God, the exact representation of God. To know God, we should look at him. And what do we see? A loving union of three. Here's one picture of it from Matthew chapter 3. Jesus was standing one day in the Jordan River. The Holy Spirit hovered over him like a dove, and the Father called from heaven, You are my Son who I love. With you I am well pleased. According to the Bible, this family of love predated and produced the world. And there's good news. The Son of God has come to invite us in. 2. The world is shaped by two representatives. The Bible begins with the story of Adam. Adam is a name that means humanity. He's a representative. In the beginning, he turned from God, turned in on himself, and plunged the world down into death and curse. This is the life we know, the life of selfishness and death. Jesus, though, is the second Adam. Where Adam and all of us fail, the Son of God took charge. He lived the life that we should live. Then on the cross, he died the death that we should die. On Easter Sunday, he rose again to new life. And this life is ours if we are one with him. One. You are one with Adam. Be one with Jesus. We're all a part of the selfishness of Adam, and we all feel the curse of his broken world. But Jesus offers us new life. If we trust in Jesus, we become one with him. We can give him our selfishness and sin, and he deals with it on the cross. In return, he gives us himself forever. Connected to him, we enter the family of God, and now, together, we can know his Father as our Father, his Spirit as our Spirit, and his future as our future. You see, Jesus will come again to raise up this world the way he was raised, to eternal life and peace. On that day, God will judge the world, confirming his no to Adam and his yes to Jesus. That's life according to Jesus. What's our response? Right now, the Son of God offers you life, hope, forgiveness, and eternal love in the family of God. Call out to Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, if you missed the reference, it's in our newsletter, but it's also www.3-2-1.org. Um, you'll find more clips and questions for reflection at that site to give you confidence to trust Christ with your life. Whether you're a believer or a seeking inquirer, I leave you with these words. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen.